The um, other spots you can see on the side here, this is where St. Mary's Church is and, and Mother Cabrini was. Here is the monument to the immigrant and Decatur Street was where the restaurants and a lot of other activities happened. So the app would take you through a nice walk on that. And then um, the Sicily Journal thing you can see here is this is one of the stories we posted. This was when they had the big ships in town. That's the monument to the immigrant. We wrote about the Contessa Antolina Society. They have, and I'm gonna skip here to another one, but the Contessa Antolina has every August a, a, a luncheon, a mass and a luncheon for about 135 people turned out. They have great tombs in Metairie Cemetery. There's a street there of Italian mausoleums and it's really impressive to see. Uh, also in All Saints Day, Contessa Antolina goes there for, to honor the, those that have passed before us. The um, in Metairie Cemetery is the top four cemetery in the country next to Arlington and the one in LA for the Hollywood stars and one in Boston. But I mean, the, the, uh, the welcome here from New York. We, it's great to have some people coming in. They, they love it. It's a great place to learn. There's a street there that has maybe a dozen mausoleums. There's, each city built its own mausoleum in the early 1890s so that they could, they could have a place. It was called the Mutual Beneficial Society. And that way you know you had a place to get buried. Also, on a, a side note, there's one close by here in, in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1, which was featured in the movie Easy Rider in 1969. And right after that, the Archdiocese banned letting movies be made there because they really didn't do a nice job with their movie. These are the videos that I talked about earlier that we have out. You can see the eight of them. Um, actually, Mary Claire Briscata uh, married Frank Davis. There's a story here. They've dedicated a bridge on him. And we have the St. Joseph's Day as a video. This is altars in the home, in churches, and in schools, and the parade itself. Oh. Okay. Um, and then the musicians, Lena Prima came back to New Orleans. We talk about musicians there. And we have uh, Republic Day, Columbus Day, Garibaldi. There's a lot of stuff in there that's random, but it's done chronologically. So you can follow what was going on. I'm going to get to that down the, down the road here with our presentation. We just started putting up markers. This marker's at the Jazz Museum on Decatur and Charter Street. And you can see it's got our QR code embedded in. And then this is a great way of talking about our contribution to New Orleans. This marker talks about Nick LaRocca. And Nick LaRocca, I'll, I'll give a short story on him. He was discovered in 1915 playing jazz on Canal Street to promote a fight coming up with Pete Galata, who went by the name Pete Herman. He didn't want to, Pete didn't want his parents to know he was a boxer. <laughs> Okay, so Pete was told his parents he, he was a shoeshine boy. But he learned that by doing this so much, he could do this. <laughs> right? And he became featherweight champion of the world. Wow. So, so in those days, twice. twice. Yes, thank you. So, so in those days, you didn't have, you had to drum up music. So, so Nick LaRocca is, is playing jazz, and, he, and a guy from Chicago hears him and says, I love the sound when you guys come up and play in my, my bar. And sure enough, he invites him, and they go up to Chicago. Things later, LaRock ends up in New York, and then he records an album, and it's called, it actually was called um, Liberty Stable Blues was the first one, I believe. If, you can, if, I, if, I, if I get some of that detail, let me know. But Nick LaRocca, they would be, where they were playing this jazz, uh, the ladies would stay, and, and they would have fun with their horns, I guess, playing sound. So he started playing like a horse sound on the stage, and Liberty Stable Blues came from the fact that he had this horse sound. I've got that book over there, sort of his autobiography. Then he goes to, to New York, and when they were calling it jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, mm -hmm. but people were taking and scratching the J off and calling it ass music. Uh. So Nick decided to change it, then it went to J-A-S-Z, and then it went to J-A-Z-Z. -Z. So that's how the name jazz comes along. There's a lot of stories about this. That's one version, and I'm staying with that because as I tell the story to you, I'm gonna let us Italians claim so much credit for so many things. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> People can debate them, but we're going to have fun today with that. <laughs> so, so this marker also talks about Cosmo Matassa, who you can see on the j &M Studio sign there. Uh, we went, obviously, to Louis Prima, which would introduce in swing. And then Cosmo gets the New Orleans sound, which is a big uh, bass sound, bass sound. And he recorded a little Richard. He recorded Fats Domino, Irma Thomas, some really big names uh, right there on Rampart Street. And that, that is another stop on our tour. 
Now we're going to start the beginning of history, so to speak, for Louisiana. This marker you can see here is in Buras, Louisiana, 1682. Henry de Tante comes with La Salle, and this is where they stop when they declare Louisiana for the French and everything that drains through the Mississippi River. There's a nice marker down there in Buras letting you know that. Well, four years later, Tant de La Salle leaves France, at least from Canada, to go to France and then come up the river the, uh, through the mouth. He tells Tanti to come down and they're going to meet somewhere around Baton Rouge. La Salle misses the mouth of the river and goes to Texas and his, his uh, ship mutinies on him and kills him. Tanti shows up and he's hanging out. Uh, this marker is in a place called Bayou Gula and, if, and I guess it's as close as we can get to where where it is, and you can see there's a church there, it's on the side of the, the levee by Nottaway Plantation. He hangs out for him, and he, he finally says, I gotta leave, you know, I don't know what to do, so, so it's like he didn't, couldn't text you guy, hey, where are you, you know? So he writes a note, sticks it in like a wine bottle, and gives it to an Indian chief. It says, give this to my friend when he shows up that I couldn't wait any longer. 13 years go by, Bienville shows up, and Bienville doesn't know if he's at the right place. The French had decided to colonize Louisiana, so Bienville is there, and he's looking for something that could prove that, that this is the right river, that he's on, not at the wrong place. And the Indian chief there needs a favor from him. So, he's, so he, he didn't tell him he had this note for months. And then he finally decides he needs his favor. He says, oh, by the way, we found this. And it's Tante's note to LaSalle. That lets Bienville know he's on the right river. So we can claim, as Italians, we can kind of really claim help and found New Orleans at that point, all right? Now, Jumping up a few more years, 1804. Obviously, we're on Decatur Street right now. Every, uh, and I didn't even know who Stephen Decatur was. I, I you know, spent so much time here, like, who is Stephen Decatur? Or who was Decatur? Stephen Decatur was the first international hero military for America. Barbary Coast Wars, which we kind of skip over a lot in, in history class. But the Thomas Jefferson, when we first became a country, is told he's an ambassador at France at that point in time, and he's told, uh, you got to pay us $250,000 a year or we're going to take your ships and sailors as hostage and make them slaves. And they realize that we don't, ha why would you do that? We haven't done anything. We just started our country. He says, sorry, that's the way it works here. So if you're going to sail into the Mediterranean, you got to pay the tribute. So they decide that they have to pay this tribute, but Jefferson has decided we're not going to do this forever. When he becomes president, he's got the Marines ready to go. And then if they, the Barbary, he says, we're not paying you anymore. The Barbary Coast countries of Tunisia, Morocco, Li uh, Libya, and Algiers start taking ships. And they sail in the USS Philadelphia with this big old battleship to try to handle the situation. Fortunately, he runs it on a reef, the captain. And then the Libyans wait for higher tide. They bring the ship into Tripoli, and they're using it to defend Tripoli against American ships. <laughs> so Captain Decatur gets an idea. He confiscates a ship, and they call rename it. Uh, he confiscates a, a an, uh, I guess, a, a Barbary Coast ship. I don't re remember the name of it right now, but he calls it the Intrepid, and he renames it. Sicily has decided to help America, so Sicily is actually America's first international war ally mm -hmm. in this war. They have three bases the Americans establish on the island of Sicily. They're going to sail the ship into this port to blow up the Philadelphia. They, they bring in four Sicilians to be the pilot of the ship and the crew because they need, need to be able to speak Arabic and they don't want to be talking American to try to sneak in. So the Salvador Catalano is the guy that pilots the ship called the Intrepid right next to the Philadelphia. The Marines come off the ship and blow up the Philadelphia. Catalano later wrote in his notes he thought they could have taken the ship and sailed it away, the Philadelphia, without having to destroy it. Jefferson makes Catalano a U.S. citizen and brings him back and he's in, a, in the U.S. Navy for the rest of his life in D.C. He marries the mayor of D.C.'s sister during this period. And this is, uh, this is Salvador Catalano. So we can actually take credit now for being America's first ally, all right? <laughs> and I would love to see that the street Decatur has a marker. Maybe one day we're going to get one that talks about the whole story of Stephen Decatur and who Salvador Catalano was that helped him. Okay, so here we talk about what starts to happen in the 1820s. In the 1820s, the first consulate of an Italian 
federation realize we're still five countries in Italy at this point in time is opened here in New Orleans area. I think it's Sardinia is where it came from. In 1830s, we start to see <laughs> lemons come in. Lemons are key to the whole situation because lemons are hold up well on the transport across the ocean. So you can bring the lemons in and sometimes every now and then Sicilians are staying. They're coming in from Palermo. Sicilians will stay with the ship and they start to, to migrate into New Orleans this way. This starts in the 1830s. Around 1850s, Mandarin oranges are brought in and planted at the consulate in Algiers. And now Buras has a tremendous amount. If you go down to Plaquemines Parish, the Orange Festival in December, you'll see all these oranges that was introduced by Sicilians into Louisiana and into America. The, um, what happens with the lemons, it's interesting, the Sicilian lemon was just recognized as being like the best lemon in the world. And it wasn't until, oh, I, don't want you to, I might as well jump ahead and show you the steel here. This is, I went down to film in Buras, their orange festival, somebody told me. There are all these queens of the, of the different festivals we have in <laughs> Louisiana. So every festival has them do a, a competition. And the Buras has a competition where they have to see how many kumquats they can put in their mouth. <laughs> these girls are they're great. They're every weekend or someplace. They'll be in next weekend, they'll be in independence and they have to do a meatball toss where they you know instead of the egg toss they see who can throw a meatball the further so they they put them through crazy stuff uh, but they're great because they're they're the crawfish queen to the sugar queen it, it's just a great part of, of our culture here the uh, and anyway so that's that is our orange story there 1850s the first cocktail in America is made by a Sicilian here in New Orleans it is not the Zazarac, as you might have been told. Okay, I've, I've got to call in the nun guesser to set him straight. We take credit for the brandy crusta. Okay, and that's in a book I have there on the cocktail. Uh, and I'll actually hold this up so you can see who we're talking about. This book was written in 1862 by a guy out of New York who, come, who knew, came down to New Orleans for a while. And he writes about a guy named Joseph Santini. And Joseph had figured out, and maybe was using those lemons, that he could start putting garnishes on each drink separately. And then from the brandy crust that comes the margarita and a number of other drinks. So the first guy they start to realize instead of making a whole vat of, for cocktails, you can make them individually and you're garnishing them, is Joseph Santini. And they've reopened in his honor the bars called Jewel of the South. He was at the St. Charles Hotel, which was here in the quarter, and now two guys have reopened a bar last year called the Jewel of the South. And I went there and it's a, this is the drink. It's also at Arno's. The guy left Arno's and, and opened up his own bar. It's a great a great place to go, either one, for the brandy crust. Mm. Oh, this, is good. this gets to really my favorite part. Now, I don't know how many of you know this story, but, but obviously we were five separate countries. France had taken Nice away from the kingdom of Savoy 